Den neste foredragsholderen er Stefan Soblowski. Han er forskningsleder på Bekkenhetssenteret for klimaforskning og tilknyttet Geofysisk institutt. Stefan er ekspert på klimasystemet og kan mye om klimamodeller og har tanker om AI. Og jeg tenker at noen av de foredragene vi skal se først nå, de handler jo litt om at vi må også på en måte forstå hvordan landskapet faktisk ser ut, om vi skal klare å forstå og diskutere hvor mulighetene for nye veier i det kan ligge. Så da tenker jeg å gi ordet til deg, Stefan. Og så har jeg ikke sagt enda at rømningsveiene later til å være ut den døra og bak i lokalet. Så har jeg sagt det. Og så tenker jeg at noen av foredragene i dag vil være på engelsk. Jeg tror de fleste som jeg kan svare på norsk av de som holder de på engelsk. Så det tror jeg ikke er noe problem. Men det er vel opp til dere. Ja, ja. For de meste folk har sendt en innspill på det bildet som er på engelsk, og jeg er ikke så flink at jeg kan bitte mellom de to. Jeg er litt forvirret dem. So, yes, thank you for the introduction, Eivind. Um, so you've taken care of the important parts, which is where, I, where I'm working and what I'm doing. Um, so again, my background is in large-scale climate dynamics and also in very fine-scale modeling of the uh, climate system to understand climate change and its impacts. And I would say when it comes to um, AI and machine learning, very much in the um, dilettante stage of this, um, published a few papers using machine learning way back in the days. And we are building up our work now um, to address uh, some outstanding issues that we have, in particular understanding um, local scale climate change and local scale climate predictions, for example. Um, and, and I think this, this theme of understanding what's going on under the hood is, um, Know, runs through these discussions because eventually the forecasts or predictions or projections that are made with these tools will go bust at some point. And we need to be able to explain why when that happens. And this becomes especially imperative when lives are at stake. We're generally able to do this quite well with our dynamical physical models. Um, when a forecast goes bust, we can usually explain why within a couple of days, because we understand these models, we understand their shortcomings, and they're physically based, for example. When that happens with a machine learning based model, at the moment, we won't be able to say why it didn't work. So, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind, um, a little bit about the climate forecasting models, or sorry, weather forecasting models that are in use right now. And then I decided this would be a nice opportunity too to show the ways that we are using machine learning um, over on the other side of the mountains and some of the perspective on where I think that Norway can make some, um, some inroads and make some large contributions in this field going forward because I think there's a lot that we can do in this country on this. So let's see here. Oh, I want to thank my contributors too because they're very important to this. Um, Antoine Toury from Meteo France, Oscar Soterberg, and uh, Julien Bajard um, have all contributed to this presentation. So without further ado, these are all forecasts for tomorrow um, from NCMWF. One of them is actually a um, dynamical model. Any guesses which one? One was very, very obviously not a dynamical model, so that might be the easier one to point out. <laughs> so the one that is not a dynamical model is down here, and it, the giveaway is the squiggles that you see in the uh, sea level pressure contours here. That's an uh, artifact of the, um, of the algorithm, I'm guessing. Um, if it was a model doing that, it would be due to an improperly applied uh, discretization scheme, probably. So the one that is the actual model is upper left corner here. This is the ECMWF HRES um, nine kilometer horizontal resolution uh, forecast model. It's their flagship model. All the rest are um, machine learning based and they're basically more or less identical, right? 
And they look fairly similar out to about uh, five or six days, and then they start to diverge. And here's just a plot from ECMWF showing the performance of these, um, these models compared to their IFS. And IFS is their integrated forecast system. It's in red here. And you can see that they all perform fairly equally um, up until about four days. And then you start to see the integrated forecast system drop off quite a bit more steeply than the, um, than the machine learning based, based models. So it's now approached you know, the performance um, and exceeded the performance, especially at this medium range, for example. Um, but there's some important caveats to this. So all of these are trained on decades worth of reanalysis. So they're dependent on the physical models to give them the data that they need to become smart. They're all initialized with that model that I was showing in the upper left corner there. So it's reliant on all of that infrastructure at ECMWF that's producing this very high resolution, um, high res forecast. Um, so they're working now on initializing directly from observations. So that will take out a huge computational cost if you can actually do that, but you need some pretty darn good observations in order to make that a reality. Um, and of course, the performance compared to ensemble approaches at longer time ranges is still to be determined. So these are all deterministic. And the model that they're based on, the HRES, is also deterministic. So it's not a probabilistic ensemble that they're looking at there. And we know for longer time periods that a probabilistic forecast is um, much more reliable than a deterministic forecast. So that's sort of where we stand. Um, the link down here, I assume the slides will be made available at some point for people, so people can check. But ECMWF has a really nice update on you know, what you can expect in 2024 from ECMWF, and it's great things, of course. Um, and they outline some of their ambitions for, for 2024. And it's interesting to note that while they are pushing quite hard with this new um, AFS, so that's the blue line here, so that's their entry into the um, weather forecasting machine learning game. Um, they're also investing quite heavily in the next generation of their physical models, and their dynamical models. So some of the challenges in weather and climate modeling are related to this understanding what's actually happening under the hood. So explainability um, and physical interpretability is really important. And so strengthening this link between physical understanding and machine learning, so physically informed AI, is really quite important. It's important to us from a science perspective, but I think it's also important to us from an ethical perspective as well. Um, and this flows into the improved transparency that we need with these AI algorithms or machine learning algorithms. And you know, having it be explainable and interpretable when things go wrong. And also, this generalization of methods to cope with events outside of the training regime. So think about unprecedented extreme events, for example. Um, are they able to capture that? And um, also, under climate change conditions, are they able to extend beyond the experience that they have when, they are, um, when they're trained on? And so there's a need to sort of develop these solutions in ways that are kind of customized to the needs of weather, climate, and kind of earth system modeling approaches. So I'm gonna show some of the things that we're doing along these lines um, over in Bergen. And most of that is focused on the bottom half of this slide here. So data assimilation, which is the process by which our models uh, ingest information about the current state of the, the system, so the weather system, so the oceans, the atmosphere, temperatures, um, chemistry, et cetera, and then use that to build a prediction and start the model off. And then I'll also talk a little bit about emulation, which is used in a number of different ways to either emulate physically unresolved processes or to emulate physically unresolved scales, because these models, the global models run at resolutions that are of hundreds of kilometers, but people generally want information here, where they live, where they work. And, and so there's a gap in the ability of the models to provide information at those scales, and we want to try to fill that. 
It's not to say that data pros processing and sources of predictability and uncertainty aren't important, and we're working on some of those too. But just in the interest of time, I'll show just a few of these things. And there's many more. So this is some work that we're doing in the Impetus for Change project, which is the Horizon Europe project, which is focused on developing local scale information based on so-called decadal predictions. So these aren't, these aren't forecasts of the next days, but forecasts for the coming years. And we want to be able to bring these forecasts down to sort of local scales where they can be useful. So there's a lot going on here. I'll go very quickly through it, but it's a model um, that uses a so-called uh, regional climate model, which is, think of a global model that covers the whole globe. A regional model is a much smaller box that focuses in on a specific region, like Scandinavia, for example. And <clears throat> we've trained it in a perfect, model, a perfect model framework, so the results I show here are kind of idealized in a way. And like many of these approaches, it's based on a neural network. And it has 25 million parameters and takes about an hour to train on a, on a GPU, depending on the size of the domain. And then similar to, um, to GraphCast, except it's on a much smaller domain, it runs in about a minute on your laptop once it's up and going. And these are, this is really one of the advantages to these approaches for our, for our community, is the fact that they can run very quickly once you've overcome the training, um, the training demand. And it does quite well. Um, so it's, we've also been running this not in the perfect framework. What I want people to focus on here is this RCM truth, which is the pattern in temp surface temperatures we're trying to match, and the emulator. And then this is the difference between the two. And you can see that they're very, they're very close to being identical. And one of the things that we also notice is that when we compare it to a coarser resolution product that, for example, doesn't resolve the Pyrenees here, it does quite well. So the coarse resolution is in the blue line here in the Pyrenees. And then the, the truth in the RCM emulator is in the green and the red down here, and they match almost perfectly. They also are able to handle transferability, and this is really important when you want to expand the, the reach of these emulators, for example, because you can't, you don't get any gain in computational efficiency if you have to train a new, a new emulator every time you want to use it on a new global climate model, for example, or in a new scenario. So to concentrate on here is just to note that the differences between um, the, uh, the red and the green are quite small all the way throughout. So for this is looking at different climate change scenarios. This is looking at different GCMs. And the GCMs are going up, of course, the climate change signal is going up in the, in the future. And this is for very high temperatures, so the 99th percentile. And we're able to see that it transfers to different global climate models and it transfers across different scenarios. And that's a really positive development. There are some problems. We've seen some difficulties to extrapolate beyond its training uh, data set. So we still don't have an answer on whether or not it can capture unprecedented extremes. This is another example from our colleagues at the Nansen Center. The, they're using neural networks to build a model for the errors in the, model, in the dynamical model. And then they reinsert this machine learning model into this, into this model to correct the forecast as it's running. And, so, and it, so it ends up being a hybrid model. So the target, or the truth, is on the left here. The hybrid model is in the middle. And just the dynamical model on its own is on the right. And what I want you to pay attention to is what happens in the dynamical model after um, about 40 days or so. And the hybrid model and the truth stay very close to each other, but you see things start to smooth out here. That's because of error propagations, and those error propagation is not present in the hybrid model. Taking a somewhat different approach, um, Sebastian Bartolome, also at the Nansen Center, is using super-resolution data assimilation. 
So the idea here is to use a low-resolution forecast. Why would we want to do that? It's cheap. Doesn't take as much time, doesn't take as much resources. And then emulate a higher resolution field with a neural network. So you can assimilate high resolution observations and produce a high resolution analysis. And then it goes back into the low resolution space to run the model for the next forecast. So this is all about improving efficiency while still getting a, um, uh, a skillful output. And indeed, that's what happens. So you have a reduction in the errors versus uh, simple interpolation using this super resolution data assimilation. And you also are winning when it comes to the computational costs over here compared to just running the high resolution model on its own. And then the last example I'll show here is um, flood prediction and from large scale atmospheric circulation fields. So these are the kinds of things that we would get out of a um, global model, for example. And it's like low pressure systems, high pressure systems, the wind speeds, et cetera, things like that. And then seeing if we can actually get information about floods and river discharge in particular from this. Again, it's about improving the quality and also improving the efficiency of the implementation. And so they've taken um, four different approaches here. So a multiple linear regression, which is kind of shown schematically on the top, random forests, support vector machines, and a multilayer perceptron neural network on the bottom. Um, this is kind of just doing your due diligence at this point, um, and, but as it seems to be the case most of the time, the neural networks win. So here's an example of the outputs for um, river flow in western Norway, where we're mostly concerned with rain-based flooding. Um, there's a corollary plot for, for eastern Norway, which maybe I should have put in, that's more focused on snow, uh, snow melt flooding. And Basically, you want to see a good match between, um, between, the, uh, between the blue lines, which is the observed discharge, and the magenta, which is kind of hard to see on here. But um, the multilinear regression basically misses these big peaks. So you can see that here. Whereas the neural network is able to capture the large peaks that you're seeing here. It also gets the timing right, which is important. So in this large, large event here in July 2009, the multilinear regression is too early, and it's not strong enough, whereas the, multi, the neural network is able to capture that quite well. And so I'll just finish with kind of a, an aspirational, <laughs> exciting new direction, and this kind of moves from those very much fundamental science-based questions that we're trying to, trying to answer with those previous examples, and moves more towards the application side of things and what we can do um, in that arena. And retrieval augmented generation is, um, has great potential here, I think. So this is a plot. Um, don't try to publish this. Um, it, it's not based on real data, but it's based on a prompt from High Charts, which is based in Wittgensong. And I gave it the prompt to give an example of carbon emissions, global carbon emissions. And I had to say, give me an example, because if I don't say give me an example, it will say I don't have the data to do that. But with retrieval augmented generation, you can query the data. You can query databases. You can link up to ECMWF's hindcasts, for example, and then implement that in a large language model. And this has the potential to build out all sorts of machine learning-based weather and climate applications and services. And I think also, quite importantly, has the potential to democratize um, weather and climate research and make it more equitable. And I'll stop there.